folks can have access to this presentation and information after the fact. So that's why we are recording today. And um, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. I see some folks already starting to do that. Um, just a, a great a great way to do introductions with a crowd this large. All right. Well, we've got over two hundred fifty folks here. <laughs> So I think that's a, I think that constitutes a critical mass. Uh, so I'm going to dive right in. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Zach Hennessy. I'm the Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer at Public Health Solutions. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our Roadmap Advocacy Coalition meeting, soon to be renamed. Um, this is a meeting that we have been convening um, since the early pandemic era um, to bring together stakeholders across community, healthcare, and government um, to advocate for improved access to resources for New Yorkers. Um, but given um, the uh, recent award of the Social Care Networks, we will be renaming this meeting to better reflect um, its goals and objectives. So every year, hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers avoid healthcare because of concerns about money, food, housing, and other unmet needs. By the time they seek care, their health is in crisis and their lives are cut short. The goal of whole UNYC is simple, to change that trajectory, to provide more New Yorkers with trustworthy and reliable community-based resources because the right resources at the right time saves lives. That is why it is so exciting that we won the Social Care Network grant for Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan. And when I say we, I mean the collective we, um, the whole UNYC network, all of our wonderful healthcare partners, government that supported, government and philanthropy that supported us along the way. This was the culmination of years of planning and development. And the application was a, across the city, across the network effort. So thank you. Thank you to everyone who stepped up to help us bring this vision closer to reality. This is truly a historic moment for whole UNYC and for the city. We are so pleased that we have the consolidation of three boroughs. We fought long and advocated hard leading up to this through the many concept papers and revisions of the state to say, if you want equity, access, equity is access. Access depends, equity depends on access. And um, having too many of these administrative um, entities is going to be an impediment to access. And um, that was why we made the decision uh, as a network to stick to our guns and apply for all five boroughs because we really felt that the consolidation um, was critical. Additionally, there were tremendous opportunities for economies of scale because you could build this infrastructure five times, five different ways across the city, or you could build, build it once. And um, I'm pleased to say that there were, when we developed our, we have since developed our consolidated budget, um, and it means 
millions and millions and millions of more dollars for um, network members in terms of um, capacity building. Um, so uh, this is really, really good news for our network and for our network partners. So the objective today is really twofold. One is to introduce folks who may not have been on this journey with us all along the way um, to kind of our approach um, and where things stand, a little bit of current state information sharing. Um, part of that will be uh, to share with you all the details about our applications that we have uh, posted both for our network members and for our governing body. And the second will be to introduce you to the ongoing structure of this meeting um, and give you a sense of the uh, sector specific work groups that we will be creating so that as we are rolling this out, we are able to share in greater detail with the provider community, the CBO community, the health plan community, our government partner communities, um, what's relevant to them in the state's plan and the social care network manual. So we have two objectives. One is kind of level set and get everyone up to speed on uh, our approach and where we are today. And then talk a bit about how we plan to move forward uh, with this group and with our partners in, in, a, in a more organized manner. So um, you can see the agenda today uh, and um, it includes those two elements. So next slide, please. So just a, a little sense of the um, award and what it means and our long-term goal. Um, the award, the $152 million award for Manhattan, Queens, and Brooklyn over two years and eight months is an infrastructure grant. Um, this is infrastructure funding to invest in technology, community-based organization, uh, capacity building, training, technical assistance, um, and everything we need uh, to get the infrastructure up and running to provide the screening, navigation, and services in an ongoing manner. But in addition to the um, infrastructure grant, um, and this is some um, estimating done here in terms of the um, per member per month and incentive funding pool. But if you take the state's methodology for dividing up the infrastructure funding and you apply it to the uh, potential per member per month and incentive funding that is also available, there's about 1.6 billion for New York City um, to pay for the screening, navigation, and services. Um, and that's administered by the social care network. Um, so I I just want to talk about the, I want to make sure people understand those kind of two pools of resources because they're administered very differently. The infrastructure funding is a grant for, through OHIP from the state um, to public health solutions. Um, we're going to provide a lot of capacity building uh, support and dollars uh, to our partners through the through that fund pool of funding. Um, but then the per member per month funding is through uh, the health contracts with the health plans. Um, and uh, and it is primarily for the uh, costs of providing the screening navigation and services uh, that are newly available to be paid for through the Medicaid program. Um, next slide. 
And I just want to say, Zach, it seems like we might have hit max capacity for this meeting. <laughs> I think we assumed it was 500 and it looks like the setting may actually be 300. So just to reiterate what Zach said, um, we will be sending out a reporting after for those on your teams who are unable to get into the call. Sorry about that. <laughs> Many apologies. Um, this is a large, largest turnout we've had. Um, so on a, on, on a very fundamental way, what is a social care network? It's an organized technology enabled network of community based organizations that addresses the unmet health related social needs of Medicaid members. Um, currently in New York City, there is no coordinated technology enabled access to the social safety net um, for healthcare patients and Medicaid members. So, this is an incredible opportunity and investment in what is a missing piece of the public health infrastructure today. The theory here is, you know, as I talked about earlier, that when, when basic needs are met, people are better able to engage in preventive health care, uh, better manage their chronic conditions, and are less likely to re require emergency care or hospitalization, um, the, thereby driving down health care costs. Um, we all know this to be true. I, I, I know from my own experience, uh, the things that I have put in front of my health um, and the reasons why I have uh, mistrusted or distrusted healthcare in the past. Um, that's really at the heart of what the social care network is, is designed to, to address. Um, and uh, but the state's goal here is to understand at a much more granular level how conducting these screenings and providing these services uh, impacts uh, the Medicaid program in terms of health outcomes and costs. Next slide. Um, I touched on this a little, but here you see a diagram from the state that kind of shows the uh, how the different pools of funding are administered, with the purple being the infrastructure grant to the social care network lead entity, um, and then the screening and performance-based payments, uh, that larger funding pool uh, through contracts between the MCO and, and the social care network lead entity, um, and uh, the payments for the services delivered uh, between the lead entity uh, and the CBO network. Um, the, the social care network has some core functions defined by the state. Uh, it has a governance structure. We have put out our application uh, to, for uh, governing for a governing body. Um, I, we didn't do this very intentionally until we were awarded, A, because we didn't know exactly what our ge geographic region would be, and B, because of uh, the desire to avoid any perceived conflicts of interest. We wanted a very transparent process for doing this. Um, and our governance structure is a, um, subcommittee of our board. It's a, um, a, a committee of the organization that reports to our board of directors. Um, and there are, there will be one governing body for the network. The state clarified that if there were any regional consolidations, um, there would be a single governing body. Um, we have expanded our governing body to include the state required two Medicaid members. We felt there should be one Medicaid member from each borough. So we expanded our governing body to include three Medicaid members. And we will ensure that our 51% of community-based organization uh, 
seats are represent uh, all three of the boroughs, that there is good representation for each borough among um, the CBO representatives on our board. Um, the social care network um, is responsible for developing the network and operating the network, providing the community-based organization capacity building. Um, so we will be partnering um, with i strategies uh, to support a CBO needs assessment process in the first three months. Uh, we hope that you all will participate. Um, the, we will also establish a Medicaid member advisory council um, that uh, that's made up of Medicaid members from the three boroughs. The information from the CBO needs assessment survey conducted by i along with the input from Medicaid members themselves will flow to our governing body who will prioritize and set the resources for capacity building for the network. So that is how we have determined how to prioritize capacity building dollars through this grant. It is through a community engagement process. It is through the surveying of all of our CBO members and conversations, focus groups with Medicaid members themselves um, about what the priority should be. So um, that is our um, way of ensuring that the capacity, that we're providing the right training, technical assistance and capacity building for our network. The social care network also um, conducts some social care service navigation. Our approach to that is to serve as a navigator of last resort. What that means is that we there's not enough dollars in Medicaid to stand up a workforce for the Medicaid population of New York City. Um, and not only that, but there are incredible uh, community health worker and navigation resources that are under-resourced today um, that should be more adequately resourced through this opportunity. And so the role that PHS will play in social care service navigation is really to watch the data and IT platform uh, to uh, ensure that when uh, a referral is not being picked up, uh, we have some capacity to jump in and make sure that person uh, gets the support and help that they need. That's what we mean by um, the social care network serving as a navigator of last resort. Um, we are the contracting and fiscal management um, organization for the network. Um, I think this is a real strength of public health solutions in that we have been working with uh, many organizations for decades on developing uh, scopes of services uh, that work for CBOs, um, including uh, many of the services that are similar to what's provided through this fee schedule um, and the, the newly developed services. Uh, so we're really excited to um, to dig in on that. And then uh, performance management and data and technology. Our data and technology um, approach, in, it is informed based on our use of the Unite Us platform since 2018. And Unite Us will be the primary platform for our network that will have several enhancements um, to their payments platform uh, to ensure it's compatible uh, with the state's requirements. Um, the, we also included in our approach to technology a data warehousing partner. Uh, we think it's really important to be able to bring in other sources 
of data, um, both for the purposes of better serving uh, the Medicaid members, as well as uh, evaluating the program and ensuring that we have a single source of data truth and infrastructure that, ex that lasts and exists into the future um, and allows us to more effectively blend and braid other sources of revenue for the network beyond Medicaid. So for that reason, we have included a data warehousing partner, um, Hyphen, alongside Unite Us, our referral technology platform. Um, and we will additionally be investing in uh, revenue uh, cycle management product um, to ensure that we are able to very closely um, monitor uh, eligibility criteria and the rate at which um, our network is being reimbursed for the services um, we provide. Okay, so that was a lot. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, again, I covered a lot of this already in terms of our unique approach, but it is really informed on the many years of this coalition meeting, um, our experience in healthcare community partnerships of our whole UNYC network to date, um, which includes contracts with health systems and managed care organizations to provide uh, many of these services uh, today at a much smaller scale than what is contemplated here, um, plus our experience developing contracts that work for healthcare partners and CBOs. Um, and again, some of the key elements we consolidated regions to optimize access and achieve con uh, economies You can drop me at 6th Avenue and 25th. Hi, Lisa. Hi. <laughs> um, we, uh, I, I did the we, reverse. Hey, hey Lisa, <laughs> we're, we're going to, Lisa, can you mute yourself? Yeah, she's muted. Um, we propose local community coordination hubs in each borough. So we have small community engagement teams that will be on the ground in each borough, working with the organizations in that borough, uh, working with the stakeholders that are in that borough, the local community boards. Um, uh, an element of our proposal was this sustainable approach to technology. Uh, the data warehouse is central to that. Um, another unique aspect of our proposal is that we included enhanced population training and technical assistance partners, um, one group for each uh, of the enhanced populations who will support us in ensuring the network is accessible for those uh, populations and also that their own cohorts of expert organizations are well integrated with the social care network. So this means that the behavioral health um, community, for example, um, is well integrated with the social care network. Organizations supporting people transitioning out of prison and jail are well integrated with the network. Um, children and family services are well integrated with the network. Um, so we have partnered with um, some enhanced population training and technical assistance partners. Um, and again, how we resource those partners will be determined by the needs assessment process that I described, the Medicaid members themselves, um, and the uh, governing body will make those determinations. Um, we have a unique role as a non-healthcare affiliated uh, entity or organization. Uh, we think this is a strength because it will allow us to work more neutrally with the diverse um, healthcare community of providers, provider different provider groups, different managed care organizations. And we have a real emphasis on screening quality. The state has put forth some incredibly lofty and ambitious screening goals. Um, we know from our years of experience working with within healthcare um, 
that there, there can be very large volumes of low quality screenings that are not actionable and not meaningful in terms of um, outcome. And our goal here is to show how our capacity building with healthcare partners, our capacity building with community-based organization partners makes a real difference in ensuring that how these conversations happens, the way, where they happen, how they're conducted, has a real, makes a real meaningful difference on um, the extent to which people access and receive these services. Um, and so our goal, while yes, we, we, we are going to do everything in our power to meet the, the state's screening goals, but for the screenings that are connected to us and the standards that we will set as a social care network, our emphasis is on quality because we need to show at the end of this that having a coordinated, accountable network, um, a community care hub model, if you will, um, really makes a difference in uh, the quality and the outcomes of screening for health-related social needs. And then lastly, a key element of our approach is to leverage existing access points. Um, you could take the state's list as a social care network. You could receive your list and you could just take that list and try to run with it. We do not believe that that is an effective approach. Our community-based organization partners are interacting with all of these folks in one way or another on a daily basis. And so we want to start there. Um, we want to leverage existing navigation workforces, existing access points to integrate the screening in those places where people are already having the face-to-face -face encounters uh, with Medicaid members. Um, so there may be folks that we have to, to find via these lists and these lists may be useful in finding some, uh, this data may be useful in finding certain hard to reach folks, um, but we have an, a real emphasis on existing access points in our approach um, because the CBOs that we work with, many of them are interacting regularly with people who are uh, avoiding care or disconnected from care. And that is one of the most pop important populations um, that we reach here. So uh, lastly, we see this as one investment in a missing piece of the public health infrastructure for New York City, uh, which means that Medicaid, when, when, when all is said and done with the demonstration, uh, Medicaid may continue to sustain or support some of this infrastructure, but uh, will it support all of the infrastructure? We don't know. Since it is such a valuable piece of infrastructure that we're building here, we believe that there are additional use cases uh, beyond Medicaid that should be uh, braided with Medicaid funding um, in order to support sustainability for the long run. So that this is not just <clears throat> a Medicaid demonstration, but rather becomes a lasting piece of infrastructure for the city. Um, additional use cases could include Medicare opportunities. There are a lot of changes coming in 2025, um, enhanced benefit requirements for Medicare Advantage that will require a number of social uh, services or social needs to be assessed and addressed. Um, health system, community service plans. We do some of this work today with our healthcare partners, um, but building on that, being more effective at that. Um, accountable health organizations and communities. These are some healthcare use cases, but there are also many non-healthcare use cases we think that would could value, valuably 
leverage this infrastructure. Um, and so we've been having ongoing conversations with um, local our lo local government partners, including the Department of Health, Department of Social Services, Aging, ACS. Um, and all of these agencies have been really eager to think about um, <clears throat> how this uh, infrastructure can better support um, the larger social services infrastructure and the people of the city of New York. So we have a lot of milestones to meet early on in the project. Um, these milestones are constantly shifting, becoming more um, aggressive. But in a nutshell, um, we, we have between now and the beginning of 2025 um, to get this up and running. Um, we're fortunate to have uh, many uh, network participants who have been utilizing the Unite Us platform uh, since 2018. So hopefully that will give us um, a little bit of running room and some folks who will be have a, a high level of readiness um, to get started. Uh, but um, there are enhancements to the technology. There are new payments integrations um, that are gonna require a lot of uh, training uh, for groups and organizations in onboarding. Uh, and there is interoperability milestones to meet in terms of uh, making sure this data flows uh, up to the state uh, in collaboration with the regional health information organizations and the SHINee. Um, and we need to get the contracts in place with the MCOs so that um, as providers begin screening, navigating, and providing services, they can be paid through that larger pool of PMPM funding I described earlier. Um, and the state wants 25% of Medicaid members screened by March 31st, 2025, <laughs> um, which is a, a, a huge, um, hugely ambitious goal. Um, and they want 75% um a hundred percent of Medicaid members screened by that same date, March 31st in 2027. So um this is very aggressive goals in terms of screening. Um we are going to do everything we can uh to to meet the state's timeline, these milestones and goals. Um, our commitment is to doing things uh, right uh, and mostly the right way on behalf of Medicaid members, always starting with making sure that whatever we are doing along um, this path is um, is working well and is and is executed with quality first. So, um, that's the best I can say about the milestones. Um, so I will turn now to uh, Keisha uh, because we recently released some applications and we know many people on this call have probably been um, reviewing them, considering them, um, having questions about them. So Keisha's just gonna go over both our CBO network participant application and our governing body applications. Thanks, Zach. Um, so uh, now that networks have been announced, um, we are eager and excited to get underway. Last week, we released a few applications out to our ecosystem of partners. Um, the first was a CBO network application for the SCNs. Um, I know that many of you submitted letters of interest a few months ago 
And during that time, we also requested that you complete a brief online survey, answering some questions about your organizations. That process aided in our ability to submit our SCN lead entity application to the state. So thank you. Um, fast forward to the CBO network participant application that was released last week. Now that we have been awarded, this application will essentially launch the contracting process between public health solutions as the SEN lead entity and our community-based partners. Um, I know that most, um, if not everyone on this call are, are already aware of the role that community-based organizations will play in the SCNs. Um, it goes without saying, but our community-based partners really are crucial to the success of these networks. Um, while roles might vary across individual organizations, it really is you or community-based partners who will play a central role in ensuring that as a network, um, we have obtained you know, appropriate consent to access uh, you know, the information of these Medicaid members, screen them for services, refer them to providers in the network, and even share their health-related social need information with the state and other key stakeholders in the SCN ecosystem. Um, it is you, our CBO partners, who will play a central role in screening Medicaid members to assess their needs and navigating them to the appropriate community-based resources to address their needs. Um, some of you are service providers in that you provide various food, housing, and or transportation related services that will be reimbursable under the SCN. Um, we anticipate and we are required by the state to ensure that our community-based partners are well represented on the SCN's governance committee and have the ability to play an active role in making decisions about how the network functions as a member of that committee. And so we expect and anticipate, you know, that many of our community-based partners will also be members of the network's governance committee. And um, perhaps most importantly, I think we want to ensure that our community-based partners are active participants in the network and that we are creating spaces for you to share lessons learned and best practices and serve as a voice to inform the network. And so we want our partners to actively participate in the network as well. And we will create spaces um, both formally and informally to facilitate those conversations. Um, on the next slide, we have provided a high level of um, or participation requirements for community-based organizations that are interested in participating in the SCN. Um, I will say that many of these are requirements that the state has defined for community-based organizations who choose to participate in the SCNs. Um, perhaps the most important criteria is that um, you are a nonprofit charitable organization and have a valid 501c3 registration. Um, I know for those of you who have already accessed the application, you will see that there was some request for supporting information, which will just allow us during our due diligence process to validate your registration. Um, there is an expectation that community-based organizations provide services in at least one zip code and our, our whole UNYC SCN region of Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, um, that community-based organizations have sufficient staffing and operational capacity to manage screenings, navigation, and or services provided on, on behalf of the SCN. Um, we won't get into details today, but you know, as Zach mentioned, um, a significant, you know, amount of the upfront infrastructure funding that the SCNs have been awarded is uh, money that will um, go out to our network of community-based partners to support and allow you to build your capacity to support the network. And so there will be opportunities for our contracted community-based organizations to request capacity building dollars from the network to be able to build their capacity for the SCNs. 
Um, you know, other things that come along with participating in a network, having a designated point person um, for the network, um, you know, actively participating in implementation, capacity building, training, and technical assistance activities. Um, we are starting to think about and working very closely with many of our partners and will continue to engage others of you throughout this implementation process to ensure that, you know, we have a very organized onboarding process to ensure that in addition to providing you with financial resources to build your capacity, we are also providing you with, you know, knowledge-based resources to build your capacity to support the network through training and other, other technical assistance activities. Um, as Zach mentioned, Unitas will be our network's uh, data and IT platform. We are required by the state to procure one single referral platform for the SCN, which will serve as the source of truth for our CBO partners for screening, navigations, and any documentation of service provision provided on behalf of the SCN. Um, uh, Community-based partners are agreeing to be reimbursed by PHS as the SCN lead entity on behalf of the SCN for eligible services that are provided to eligible Medicaid members. Um, I know there are a lot of questions um, that we've been fielding the past few uh, weeks regarding um, the fee schedule. Uh, we are still awaiting the New York State approved fee schedule and will assure it is circulated and made available to our network partners once um, that information has been released. Um, you know, perhaps uh, most importantly, um, we as an SCN are accountable to the state um, and there will be an expectation that we are sharing information about our network back to New York State. And so as a participant of this network, um, you know, we are also kind of expecting that our community-based partners are agreeing to their platform data being shared with New York State and other key stakeholders for SCN payments to facilitate performance evaluation and other reporting requirements for the SCN. Um, and of course, right, we want to be able to, you know, publicize our great network of in our great network of partners. And so there are other few require a, a, a key a, 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 another requirement around just you know uh, being you know able to list your organization as an SCN participant in directories and other you know marketing related materials that might go out. Um, on behalf of the network. So as I mentioned, um, I, I would like to think that, you know, we've kept the bar very low in terms of any requirements of community-based organizations to participate in the network. And many of these requirements are requirements that the state has of the SCN and our community-based partners. Um, on the next slide, so the application timeline. Um, as as I as Zach mentioned, um, we released our CBO uh, network participation application. I believe it was last Thursday. Um, the application window will remain open for another week before it is closed on Thursday, August twenty second. Um, along with the application, I believe we have requested a few additional documents. One of which will allow us to verify your organization's five O. 13C status, um, which of course, as I mentioned, is the number one and most important requirement for a CBO to participate in the network. Um, once the application window closes, our procurement team will conduct an administrative review of the applications along with any supporting documentation that was submitted for both completeness and accuracy. Um, and once complete, this process will then launch our third party risk in compliance due diligence process, which is something that is required of organizations that are contracting with public health solutions. Um, once everything checks out, and I know it will because we've got some really great partners, um, this essentially launches the contracting process. Contracts will be sent out electronically via our contract management system to appropriate points of contact at your organization to review. And ideally, this leads to contracts being executed between Public Health Solutions as the SCN lead entity and our numerous community-based partners. Um, it is important to note that for the CBO network applications, there isn't a selection committee that's 
looking at your applications to assess whether your organization is a good fit for the network, let's say based on your mission. Um, you know, as a community-based partner, if you are willing to meet the requirements that have been established for CBO participation in the network, um, many of, as I mentioned, many of which are largely the state's requirements, and our third-party risk team gives us the green light, um, a contract is executed and you are officially a part of the SCN network. Um, High-level timeline, as I mentioned, the CBO network application will be open for another week before it closes. Um, while we hope and strongly recommend that all of our community-based partners submit an application prior to next Thursday, we are also realistic um, and we know um, there are perhaps community-based organizations across the city who have never heard of public health solutions and will learn about the waiver two to three weeks from now and will want to participate in the network. Um, there might be others who are still assessing the opportunities available to your organization under the waiver, especially knowing there is some information that we are still awaiting from the state, including uh, this, this, this much anticipated um, enhanced service fee schedule. And so because of this, this will not be the only opportunity for a CBO to join the network. Um, in an effort to streamline the process and ensure that it is structured and well-organized, we will follow a similar process in the future and that we will not be accepting and reviewing one-off applications, but rather there will be an application period where CBOs who are interested in joining the SCN can apply and it will follow a similar administrative review, third-party risk compliance and contract execution process. We have not yet defined the timeline for subsequent periods just yet, which is why I strongly recommend getting your applications in prior to the 22nd, but we do acknowledge there will be a need for future solicitations. Um, so that's the CBO network participation application. Um, as I mentioned earlier, last week, along with that CBO network application, we also released two additional applications, one for Medicaid members who are interested in participating on the SCN's governance committee, and the second for individuals who are interested in representing an organization on the committee. Um, New York State expects and requires that social care networks establish a formal governing body within 60 days of award. And so recognizing the important role of our community-based partners and the role that they play in the network there is an expectation that CBOs will constitute at least 51% of the governing body's representation. Um, other health care and care management providers are also eligible, for, for lack of a better term, to sit on the governance committee. This includes um, federal qualified health centers, um, behavioral health providers, health systems, um, mental health and substance use providers are preferred, as well as local, local health departments. Um, there is also an expectation that Medicaid members have a seat at the table and an opportunity to provide input into decisions about the SCN. And so social care networks, networks must also ensure that at least two Medicaid members with current and or past health-related social needs experience also sit on the network's governance uh, governing body. Um, on the next slide, you'll see, uh, you know, the, the governance committee is really as it sounds. Um, and, and really, so you can go to the next slide. Um, th this body will be responsible for setting SCN priorities and making key uh, operational and programmatic decisions for the network. Um, at PHS, our SCN's governing body will be set up and established as a committee of our PHS board. Today, we have multiple subcommittees of our board, and this SCN committee will be another. Um, it will be chaired by a current PHS board member to ensure a consistent linkage and facilitate bi-directional communications between this governance committee for the SCN and our PHS board. Um, on the next slide, we have summarized uh, the requirements of, you know, 
organizations and or individuals that are interested in um, participating on the governance committee. Um, as those of you who have accessed the applications might have already seen, there really aren't too many requirements to be a member of the SEN's governing body. Um, we do expect that members commit to a three-year term that aligns to the SEN's contract period, which currently ends March 2027. Um, we are requesting that members commit to in-person meetings and that they only send a delegate in exceptional circumstances and with advanced approval of the governance committee chairs. Um, meetings will be held monthly, at least for the first six months and quarterly thereafter, and unless noted otherwise, they will be held at our central office in lower Manhattan. Um, we are anticipating the first governance committee session will kick off towards or around the latter part of September. Um, members will be expected to attend at least 75% of the meetings to maintain their seat on the committee. And as a token of our appreciation and thanks, um, Medicaid members will be compensated for their time and active participation on the committee. Um, okay, so application. Um, as mentioned earlier, there were two governance applications released, one for individual Medicaid members and another for individuals representing organization. For those who are representing organizations, um, the represented organization must either be a community-based network, as I mentioned, um, and that organization um, must have a contract with the SCN. We realized that we were kind of doing both applications together, and so there will be a consideration and even a prioritization for those um, applications that are submitted for those individuals and or organizations who submit both network as well as governance committee applications, given the need for us to get this governing body in place to be able to inform network design, planning, and implementation decisions. Um, it could be, as I mentioned earlier, a healthcare or care management provider, um, behavioral health providers, health systems, federally qualified health centers, health homes. Um, there's a strong preference for representation from mental health and substance abuse provider representation on the governance on the governance committee and local health departments. Um, community advocates that are not directly affiliated with a healthcare or care management provider organization can also apply um, to become a member of the governance committee. Um, of course, the organization that is being represented must provide services in the SCN region of Brooklyn, Queens, and or Manhattan, um, service enhanced population members, as well as provide health-related social care services. Um, individuals applying to represent an organization um, we are recommending that they are members of that organization's executive team. Know that that what that means can vary across organizations, um, and thus that will be considered during um, the, the review process. Um, New York State does expect that SCN lead entities ensure their governing bodies include representation from a multitude of individuals across race, ethnicity, disability, age, socioeconomic status, and so individual lived experience and diversity will be considerations for committee representation. So that's the, you know, high level of um, organization governance committee requirements. For Medicaid individuals, this list is very short. You must be an active Medicaid member with either past or current experience receiving health-related social needs navigations and or services. Um, Medicaid individuals, of course, on the committee must reside in the SCN region, either Brooklyn, Queens, and or Manhattan. Um, and past leadership, and I use that term loosely, and or advocacy experience uh, is preferred. Um, High-level governance committee timeline, you'll see on the next slide, similar to the CBO network application timeline. It follows a very similar timeline. The big difference here being that we do not anticipate another governance committee application. We are eager to get the network stood up. And because of that, we need 
to establish our governing body so that the committee can start to make key decisions to inform our network's planning and implementation. Um, governance committee applications like the CBO network applications will be open for another week. Um, once it is closed, a selection committee will review the applications. It will be an objective review process, as I mentioned, with considerations for things such as geographic representation across our regions of Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, enhanced service population experience, services offered, organization size, organizational leadership, diversity, et cetera. Um, the selection committee aims to conduct and complete the application reviews the week of August 26 in hopes that we will be able to notify committee members no later than early September. Um, so I know that was a lot to digest. <laughs> I know that you know many of you submitted questions via our procurement portal. Um, a lot of questions were asked in the chat today, and we are diligently working to turn around responses on the portal, especially and get them posted. Ideally, today we have a summer-wide all-office event tomorrow, so I think we're definitely going to try to ensure that we get those responses out there today. Um, but before we pivot into maybe talking a little bit about how we plan to keep you engaged throughout this process and allow you the opportunity to inform the process. Wanted to just ask if there are any pressing questions, comments, or concerns. I don't anticipate that we will be able to get through all of your questions today and or address all of the questions in the chat, but want to allow the opportunity for a few questions before we pivot, uh, pivot the agenda. And perhaps I'll try to go through. I know the team have been monitoring the chat and if there are some that you've identified that we sh can answer, um, we can definitely do that. Hi, Keisha, it's Michelle Drayton. May I ask a question? Sure. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm with the United Way of New York City, uh, VP for um, Health Equity. Just a question regarding uh, which application would be appropriate for sort of a hub lead. And if you could sort of maybe describe you know, in your sort of estimation of, of the function of the hub lead, um, what that is in terms of responsibility. So I'm presuming a hub lead is an organization that has many different CBOs that sort of they, they partner with uh, and that's relevant for um, sort of our role. And those partners have health navigators that we fund and health advocates that do social determinants of health screening. I can I can jump in. Um, the the state uh, intends the capacity the infrastructure dollars to flow directly from the social care network to network members. So infrastructure dollars, any organization who is interested in training, technical assistance, or capacity building funds should apply directly. Um, in other words, we don't want any organization um, to uh, apply on behalf of a, a group of organizations uh, because the state will not allow us um, to uh, disperse the infrastructure dollars to an intermediary. Um, so my suggestion for organizations that do have networks of CBOs is to apply like any other CBO because there are more details coming out about the role of hub organizations, things like IPAs and organizations like your own United Way. We've, we've seen a draft manual and we have a lot of questions. We're not allowed to share the manual yet, but there may be a role for hub organizations or um, IPA lead organizations in the screening, navigation, and service provision in a way that streamlines the process for their members and their organizations. There's one of the work groups that we plan to establish is like an IPA slash hub health home um, uh, entity work group 
uh, to together go through that manual and think about what the opportunities are um, for those of us who who operate networks. Thanks, that's, Zach. That's, that's, sorry, that's it's not helpful. a more satisfying answer, but the infrastructure dollar piece of it, the state is very clear about that, that the, the dollars are to go direct to to the organization between the SCN lead entity and the organization itself. Um, well, I, I know there have been a lot of questions asked in the chat and we will definitely do our best to ensure that we respond to them after the meeting. Some of these might be appropriate for these work groups that we're going to talk about in a few seconds. Um, just trying to see if there are any others that jump out, given that we oh, do technically. I, have I can, members. I can, I can click off a couple, Keisha. Okay. Um, John Betts asked about executive team member being defined for organizational applicants to the governing body. It, we don't have a clear, exact definition of that. We don't want to have someone who has to go back to their organization before they vote. So that's why we have the executive team member um, definition is because we want someone on this board who can make decisions without having to go back and consult at their organization. We're on a really tight timeline. And so that ability to be a decision maker is important. Um, will organizations need their own designated OMIG officer involved? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. We have an upcoming meeting with um, OMIG around compliance. Um, I think it's too soon for us to be able to answer that question, Ashley. Um, member eligibility and payment structure. There are many draft details in the state's social care network manual that have been released about the clinical eligibility criteria for services. Um, it's our understanding that the social care network will have a roster with many of these criteria identified. So we will have an eligibility roster. And within our technology platform, you should be able to see whether or not someone is eligible for the enhanced services. Um, I, I have one. Will the relationship with the shiny um, need to also be on the CBO side or just the SCN, the SCN? Um, one of the, the main reasons why um, the SCN is required to procure a single data and IT platform is so that that platform can serve as a source of truth for um, our screening, navigation, service provision data, and reporting back to the state. So the SCN will be responsible for establishing that connectivity with the qualified entities that will play an active role in facilitating data to and from the shiny. Um, Michelle asked about targets for services. They don't have targets for services. The targets are for screening. I, I think there will be, now that we have start, seen some of the eligibility requirement for services, the bar is set high for some of those services. Um, and I think what they're trying to ascertain at the outcome of this demonstration is how many mem Medicaid members benefit with, the, with these sets of, of clinical requirements. Um, how many CBOs do you anticipate being a part of the SCN? Um, during the application phase, we received letters of interest from over 150 CBOs. I think with this application, we are um, a little over maybe 200. Um, so we are anticipating that that number will likely continue to grow over the upcoming months. Um, you know, many of our community-based partners do provide services that span, you know, multiple boroughs or even citywide, um, which I think is, is a great thing about our, our network. But we also want to ensure and will continue to ensure that, you know, we are engaging, you know, maybe more borough-based uh, smaller CBOs in the network as well. Um, uh, the question about immigrants, regardless of documentation, documentation status. So um, I want to differentiate here between the whole UNYC network and um, 
the social care network Medicaid eligibility um, requirements. Um, we we believe that this the whole UNYC network should support all New Yorkers. Um, there will be many immigrants who may not be eligible for uh, the Medicaid uh, funded services. We hope to provide training and technical assistance to organizations who serve immigrants on who is eligible for what um, within their, uh, their populations. And if you have um, insights, experience, um, that you'd like to share with us, please, please do reach out. Um, and our, our what I mentioned the navigator of last resort um, approach. Uh, we have a concern that um, there will be a lot of ineligible people screened and uh, they will have more barriers to access uh, to services than those who are eligible. And so that's why we are establishing a coordination center um, that serves as a navigator of last resort uh, to work those most difficult uh, cases. Um, Medicaid eligibility, does Medicaid member inclusive of all types of Medicaid plans? No. Um, <laughs> enhanced services are for managed care members only. Uh, Medicaid straight Medicaid members are eligible for screening, navigation, and navigation to the existing social safety net. That doesn't sound equitable to me, but um, that is uh, the state's uh, conclusion. There, um, there are also specific carve outs. For example, the family planning benefit program is not eligible. There are a couple of other sort of non-Medicaid state funded uh, plans that are not eligible. So it is not inclusive of all types. Um, um, there's the question about CBOs needing to play a role in screening. No, not every CBO will be a screening CBO. Um, some CBOs can just deliver services um, and the requirements might be very different. Um, for an organization that is collecting screening information um, versus an organization that is uh, delivering a food service, for example. So I think we can, like, there's yeah. several other questions here. There's too many to answer within this context. If we didn't get to your question, um, we will, uh, respond to these questions after the call. Um, if there are some that are similar to one another, we'll um, address them concurrently. Um, but apologies for not being able to to go through through all of them. Uh, we we do before we um we we wrap up for today, if, uh, and I think it might be the slide nineteen release that. We we want to at least you know inform you of opportunities that will be available for you to um, provide input into this process and stay informed of um, implementation progress. Um, as you can imagine, um, there has been an overwhelmingly positive response to um, notification of awards by many of you, our partners, in wanting to understand what are the next steps, wanting answers to some of your questions, wanting insight into the timeline, and wanting to better understand implications for your organizations. And so in an effort to ensure that, you know, Zach, Lisa, and my inboxes are, are not bottlenecks to you getting answers to your questions and being able to assess this opportunity and what it means for your organizations. Um, over the next few weeks, we will be establishing stakeholder work groups to ensure that one, there is some organization around how we will engage our partners over the next few months. Um, and perhaps most 
uh, most importantly, ensure that you all are hearing the same messages from us and have an opportunity to inform the network's planning, rollout, and operations. And so right now we're going to, you know, test out stakeholder-specific work groups. Um, we know many of our managed care partners are asking the same questions, especially as the state continues to release more requirements. What does the eligibility file handoffs look like? What does the SCN MCO bidirectional communication process look like? A lot of our provider partners, you know, are asking questions about patient consent and their potential role in screening on behalf of the network and how do we establish these bidirectional workflows uh, across our organizations. Um, you know, our government partners are asking, you know, questions about what is our role in the SCN and how do we share data and collaborate to improve outcomes for, you know, Medicaid beneficiaries residing in the city. And so we will start with the stakeholder work groups. There will be five work groups, CBOs, providers, managed care organization, government, and some of our other care management IPA partners who manage integrated networks today. Um, while these are stakeholder specific work groups, we will also continue to ensure that we are bringing the larger group together for cross-sectoral insight and collaboration. Um, links to a very short sign-up form will be shared when we distribute today's meeting recording, and then we will be reaching out to those who have expressed interest in participating in the stakeholder work groups in hopes of launching initial meetings with the work groups in September. Um, so, you know, one, thank you for your, your interest in, you know, supporting um, this, this, this SCN and participating in this huge initiative. Um, you know, we are eagerly interested in, eagerly interested in working very closely with each of your organizations and ready to get up and running and and we'll do our best to ensure that we are engaging you keeping you informed in the process and leveraging your expertise and your advisory as we continue to ramp up these networks um and with that said i think we are good for today if there are no other questions i i see that rosita uh, has a hand yes um i wanted to ask uh, about uh if this is going to be a an open competitive process or is it limited to people who submitted uh the loi uh, i'm trying to figure out if um other people uh that and didn't do the loi can still join Yes, so it, it the, the application is out now. It is not a competitive application. It is just to make sure anyone meets the basic requirements as a nonprofit organization to participate. So the state has been clear that they, they don't want, they want any organization who's interested and eligible to to be able to participate and contract. So you use the word competitive. I'm going to say it's it's not, this is not a competitive process and it's open now. So you did not have to complete an LOI with us um, to join now. Um, I already completed the LOI in the yeah. past. I'm thinking okay. about other organizations, colleagues that I might want to share the please. information. Yeah, definitely please, share it. Please. And, and okay. And we will ensure that we get the recording out timely so that we can also reshare the link to the applications on our procurement portal in the event that there are organizations that you are aware of or organizations on this call today that did not receive it. Um, we still have 15 minutes, so maybe I'll check check off the questions that I can to reduce the um post re follow up requirement the um, application is not binding um it does not bind you to signing a contract with the with the network yeah so the if you submit an application we'll check to see if you're eligible and then we'll send you a draft contract you know if you review that contract and you don't like something about it or you don't want to do it, um, you don't have to do it. Um, 
how do community, oh, there were some questions about the screening tool. It is the Accountable Healthcare Community Screening Tool. It is a subset of the questions and of the total tool. And it includes, it will include a question zero, which is a consent to share the screening information with the health information exchange and the social care network. So um, the state has been uh, pretty clear that they are sticking with that screening tool. So community providers who have screening protocols in place for um, screening their protocols may need to change, yes. Uh, I see an iPhone with the hand raised. Hi, Zach. Hi, Zach. Oh, hi. Net Rote from London, where I've been. How are you? Hi, everyone. I'm um, my question is, you said you sent out applications to uh, organizations. Where, where we would e what would be the email that it was sent from? Um, um, maybe Mary and others, if you're still on the line for procurement, can answer that. It was released from our procurement team. I'm not quite sure what the actual email um, is. I'm going to... You should have received the application from um, our procurement portal. There should be details in the email around what the application is for. And I believe the sender is um, no reply at Go Bonfire. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. And if you can't find it, it just, in... I'll, if you can't find it, then you can shoot me an email and I'll send you the link too. Thank, thanks, that. Um, has the fee schedule been announced? No. Um, and we hope to have more to share about that soon, but no, we don't have a fee schedule yet. Um, Dr. David Goldstein. Thanks, Zach. And thanks for this. It's very helpful. Um, I'm David Goldstein. I'm the executive director of New Alternatives for Children, a child welfare agency. And quick question about screening. It might be premature. Uh, for children living uh, at, in out-of-home placements, namely foster care, uh, and are uh, you know living with a, a foster parent, um, when you're screening for social determinants, are you screening in the, for the home they're currently in or the home they we hope to return them to? Because uh, it makes a big difference. I don't know if there's an answer, but it's something we should certainly consider going forward. They haven't addressed that nuance that I've seen yet, but what they have said is that if they're, whatever the uh, family unit currently is, all members can be screened and eligible. In other words, if there is a parent-child dyad um, and the, they are both eligible, they are both eligible for everything. There's no restriction on, uh, you know, because the parent is receiving it, the child can't receive it or vice versa, or because a household is receiving um, one set of food box, they can't receive three. Uh, there are, we've seen some draft details um, on uh, for um, foster, families, but they're still, it's still a working document. So we're, we, we can't share it yet, but as soon as we can, we will. Thank you. Zach Hall. I'm sorry for not returning your call yet, Zach. It's quite all right. I know you guys are quite busy. I, I called Keisha too. So uh, <laughs> listen, um, appreciate this because you're asking a lot of my questions, but one uh, thing I mentioned, I think, on a call was that the screening tool, I think there's 12 questions that the state has, I don't think does a good job of identifying Medicaid uh, eligible folks for nutrition counseling or education. And um, I work with the nutritionist on staff to put some supplemental questions. Love to talk to you guys about what that could look like. Is there opportunities to adjust this in the, in the platform or with the state to accommodate that? So what we are, uh, what is currently underway with Unite Us involves the process between screening and service type mapping. Um, and there are 
a number of additional eligibility criteria for services um, that will need to be considered um, when designing the mapping of services to the screening tool. And this is a very good time uh, to share that information with us so that we can share it with Unite Us and discuss what um, can or could be included beyond the screening tool. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I know you guys are off or dealing with uh, your org wide thing, but maybe top of next week if you have some time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there was a Thanks. great question from Teresita. Uh, does infrastructure funding include new staff up to how many? Yes, it includes staffing. Again, our CBO needs assessment process will allow us to set the amount of resources for each type of um, capacity building funds. So at the end of that process, we should know the total amount of resources that will be available to CBOs for staffing up specifically. Um, and we will be very um, transparent about around the criteria for how to be eligible for those um, staffing up resources. Uh, German? Hermann, Hermann. Uh, Hermann. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. And Zach's an old friend, so hi, Zach. Um, and just uh, two questions about uh, the screening tool, about how long average-wise, just on, just the calculations of what, you know, you have staff have to go through, about how long is the, is the, is the screening tool going to take on average? And the other is just to repeat, when would this, the target start date would, would be for this? Do any of our navigation team who are on this call know how long it takes? Just an, an idea, because you need a calculation for the staff. That's what it is. Um, I mean, it's, it's about, what, eight or in between eight to ten questions, maybe, give or take. Um, and I think they're high-level questions about food and food insecurity, food security, housing instability, um, transportation barriers. And then there, I think there are about four or five interpersonal safety related questions that are not required. But if one of those questions is answered, all of the others must yeah. be responded to. I, I'm going to say because of the nature of the, the questions that are being asked, this is a real conversation. It's mm -hmm. not, it's not, would you like an HIV test today? Right, right, right. Um, yeah, and especially so you when you're take talking 20 minutes, about asking 30? about interpersonal violence, I, I I think it's a twenty minute. Yeah, I think it's a twenty minute encounter. Okay, thank you. And uh, the start date again when you when you project. So the contracts with the plans um, are supposed to be in place in the month of October. Um, realistically, I think for organizations to begin delivering and being paid for services. The state wants that by January 1st, 2025. Thank you. There's a sort of a lot of preparation we need to do with you all along the, the path to getting there. Tim Kelly. Thanks, Zach and Keisha. Uh, I'm from Advantage Care Physicians, a community provider across Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens. And just curious, we want to make sure that as a provider group, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And I don't think we, you know, are applying as a CBO, but want to make sure that our screening protocols and any of the work that we do with CBOs to refer patients and bring them back to medical care. Um, so just curious what we should be looking out for and, you know, if there's any guidance on steps we should be taking leading up into October. If you are a 501c3 nonprofit, I don't know if you are, are you? No, not the provider group. No. Okay. Uh, but for everyone's benefit, if you're a 501c3 nonprofit healthcare or non healthcare, we encourage you to take a look at the eligibility requirements. And if you agree to them, to submit an application now. Um, there are, as I mentioned, there is a draft manual that um, is being reviewed currently by the social care networks. Um, in there, there are um, several plans for how to integrate screenings from different provider group types. You should be joining our healthcare 
uh, work group uh, so that we can, as soon as the state says it's okay to um, review with folks, we can go through that in, in great detail um, with, with you as a healthcare provider group. Okay, great, thank you. Um, extension of application deadline. Sorry, uh, sorry, I just saw the iPhone. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know the app, the current application window will close Thursday, but there will be subsequent opportunities TBD um, on on when those additional application periods will occur. Um, but highly suggest and recommend as many of our community based partners as possible get your applications in prior to Thursday. Uh, there's an iPhone with your hand raised, and then we're approaching 1130, so we want to be respectful of everyone's time as well. If that's me, that was an accident. Um, <laughs> that was an accident. I'm so okay. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I mean, I think we've answered as many as we can. We understand that there are other questions in the chat that we weren't able to get to, and we'll do our best to ensure those are answered either as a follow-up to the meeting or as the stakeholder work groups are formed. Um, thanks for your interest. Thanks for your participation in supporting this, this important initiative, and we will definitely be in touch soon. We're on our way. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Have a good one, everyone. As we say, vaya con Dios, amigos. Thank you all. Have a good one. Bye.